Are you ready, Foreign Secretary? Of Excuse course, me. please. Do, do your water and then we'll... Then we'll... Oh. So you're doing all of this in person now, no longer any mixed virtual? No, no virtual at all. We're all, all, all in person now. Order, order, welcome to this afternoon's session of the Foreign Affairs Committee. This extraordinary session is during the recess of Parliament, following the events in Afghanistan in the last few weeks. We are very lucky to have the Foreign Secretary, uh, the Right Honourable Dominic Raab, with us uh, this afternoon. And just for the avoidance of doubt, the committee sits as a uh, select committee of Parliament and asks questions on behalf of uh, the people of the United Kingdom uh, I know this is being broadcast rather more widely than many uh, sessions are, so I think it's worth remembering that these are not personal questions, these are questions to the government from the people of the United Kingdom and Parliament. Thank you very much, Foreign Secretary, for coming in. May I just start by asking, how many of your ministers are overseas at the moment? Uh, I don't have that precise detail, but we have a rotor system in place, which means we're already always ready, able and willing to cover. So there's always ability to, to, uh, to back cover. And do you have any in uh, either Afghanistan or in the region around Afghanistan at the moment? So we're always very careful about signalling travel uh, uh, movements because of the security implications. But I can tell you I'm leaving after this committee um, to go to the region uh, and uh, other ministers will of course be engaged in similar diplomatic endeavours, whether it's by phone or indeed by travel. And since uh, just before the fall of Kabul on the 15th of August, uh, how many contacts did you have uh, with people like Mohreddin or Meredov or indeed Kamilov uh, in the region? Well, just to give you a sense, um, as I've, I think, already been clear, but throughout August, uh, I've spoken with Foreign Minister Qureshi, for example, uh, the Prime Minister spoke to Prime Minister Khan. Uh, Lord Ahmed was in Pakistan during June. Opportunities for all of those conversations. Um, and we obviously stay in regular touch by ambassadors. Uh, it's probably also worth, uh, in terms of Pakistan and Afghanistan, explaining some context. From early 2019, uh, we have been facilitating a private high-level uh, channel uh, between Afghanistan and Pakistan. It was led by the Chief of the Defence Staff, it was bolstered by senior officials in my department, uh, and one of the reasons we set that up and I wanted to continue it and indeed have it report directly to me is to make sure we have more granular advice on the developments uh, on the ground and a greater ability to influence it. I oversaw that directly. Um, uh, CDS reported to me, if, uh, FCO, FCDO officials did as well, and obviously it's a supplementary means, but quite an important one, given uh, from the normal um, channels. I'm very happy to uh, give you the outline of it here, but clearly we're quite careful uh, about what we say more generally. But it does, does provide, I think, some context in 2020 and 2021 of the engagement. I wonder whether I could just take this opportunity, Mr Chairman, to point out uh, from the period mid-March to the 30th of August, I had over 40 uh, meetings or telephone calls where Afghanistan was on the agenda. So that's broadly one at least every four days. Um, and uh, that will vary from the NATO foreign ministers meetings, the G7 foreign ministers meeting where I put Afghanistan on the agenda, through to the bilateral contacts with the likes of Turkey, um, through to UN Special Envoy Jean Arnaud. Um, uh, also bear in mind, I appreciate there's a lot of scrutiny about things like calls. Uh, this is taking place uh, along with a range of other simmering issues which may or may not bubble up to crisis. Uh, Iraq, the situation there is very delicate. Iran, JCPOA negotiations, the dual national situation, tax on shipping, Yemen, Tigray, Somalia, Hong Kong, Belarus, Ukraine, coupled with COVID. So I just make the point very gently, if I may, Having a delegation and a division of labour between ministers, particularly my senior ministers of state, actually is a, an essential part of the work we do. Foreign Secretary, I agree with you absolutely. 
Uh, therefore, may I ask very briefly, uh, when was the last time a foreign minister went to Uzbekistan? Went to Uzbekistan? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I'd have to check, but we've obviously been in a few countries. When was the last time a foreign minister went to Tajikistan? Again, I don't have the, uh, the visit uh, list, but I'm very happy if you give me your list to provide it. For example, on Uzbekistan, of course, given the need to ensure third part, safe passage to third countries, uh, Lord Ahmed has been in touch with the Uzbek Foreign Minister. I'm scheduled, I was supposed to speak to them today, but it's a national holiday, I'll speak to them. Uh, tomorrow, so obviously we uh, remain uh, engaged. And if you would like to know the visits, very happy to come back to you. I'd be very grateful. It seems particularly relevant because Heiko Maas was recently in Uzbekistan arranging the evacuation of German people through uh, Tashkent, and it seems to be a route that worked extremely effectively for Germany. Although, May I? although they have just closed the border. Indeed, they have now, but the Germans got their people out first. May I just ask on the... Um, Would you like me to speak to a third country what we are doing? I'm just about to come to that Very exact good. question, um, because you will also have had uh, contact with, of course, our missions in these countries uh, before the 15th of August in order uh, to prepare for a likely fall of Kabul or indeed a collapse of the regime. And I'd be very grateful for when you spoke, or whether you can remember speaking to people like Matthew Lawson or Hugh Philpott, for example. Well, all of our ambassadors would feed in their advice through the centre, particularly by the time we were, uh, we'd set up the FCTO emergency response team. So actually, I, I wouldn't, I mean, it would depend on the issue. Obviously, I've been in regular contact with Sir Laurie Bristow, um, uh, and, and I've had discussions with uh, various different ambassadors who have joined meetings. But actually, the way that it works is that the ambassadors feed through their advice. We obviously see it. It's triaged up. But we get it together. It's uh, triaged up and, and brought together. So I get a full picture. And that's done through, uh, for example, during the time when we had the emergency response team uh, operating the evacuation, um, and indeed before uh, my... Uh, Director for Afghanistan, Nigel Casey, and also Tom Drew, my Director General. The reason I ask these questions is because uh, in your media round yesterday, uh, you said that it wasn't the responsibility of the Foreign Office uh, for the errors in intelligence that had led us to this position. And I just wondered, I mean, clearly the Prime Minister is responsible for the Joint Intelligence Committee and the assessment it makes. Is that where the responsibility lies with the Prime Minister? Well, actually, you'll recall that after the Chilcot inquiry in the uh, second Iraq war, uh, the JIC was there to give an independent assessment of intelligence precisely to avoid politicise, uh, politicisation. Um, but ultimately, uh, you have the JIC giving its assessment. Um, and you then have the military uh, and the diplomatic assessment that's layered on top of that. So it was a collective assessment through the JIC. It was a collective assessment through the JIC that uh, you were referring to. It wasn't a particularly military assessment. Is that correct? Well, uh, the, the JIC is there to provide um, the information, if you like, the raw intelligence is distilled down, and then uh, that is backed up by the military assessment, for example, on things like uh, uh, intent, although, frankly, um, it's a cross-cutting issue. Um, my, my point is this, the central assessment that we were operating to, um, and it was certainly backed up uh, by both the JIC uh, and the military, is that the likely, most likely, the central proposition was that given the troop withdrawal by the end of uh, August, you would see a, a, a steady deterioration from that point, uh, and that it was unlikely Kabul would fall uh, uh, this year. Uh, that was the central assessment and of course with all the usual caveats that you will be familiar with. That doesn't mean we didn't do contingency planning or game out or test the other propositions. And just to be clear, that's something that was widely shared, that view, amongst NATO allies. May I just come straight on to that? Um, you clearly are responsible for overseeing two of our intelligence agencies. Did their intelligence differ, without revealing what it was of course, did their intelligence differ from that assessment? I, I'm certainly not going to go into the details of raw intelligence. The whole point of the JIC is to distill and provide an objective, rounded assessment. Uh, and I think that's quite right. Okay. And I think, uh, they, think they did their job, the, um, uh, uh, very professional. So may I just ask, your principal risk report of the 22nd of July 2021 read, 
uh, on Afghanistan. Peace talks are stalled and US NATO withdrawal is resulting in rapid Taliban advances. This could lead to fall of cities, collapse of security forces, Taliban return to power, mass displacement and significant humanitarian need. The embassy may need to close if security deteriorates. This was on the 22nd of July. How did your actions change after that report? I'm sorry, the, the source of that? It's your principal risk report. Yeah, well, as I said, of course we uh, are very mindful of that. So, as I said, um, if you look at um, high-risk embassies, it, from the point of view of the embassy safety, as opposed to the evacuation, I think those two things are important to distinguish. We have a standard uh, evacuation process for high-risk embassies like Kabul. Um, obviously, that's reviewed um, and has to evolve and adapt to the conditions, which is uh, why your um, uh, what you said is, is uh, timing. Of course, we keep it under review. As I said, the central assessment remained uh, until uh, late that the deterioration would be uh, uh, incremental, um, and the planning for military withdrawal um, obviously began in April. Um, but the contingency uh, planning uh, was also there. Uh, for a more uh, rapid deterioration and you can see that in the run-up to the G7 uh, summit in June one of my focuses was as we anticipated the potential shift from the embassy in the green zone to the airport and the Taipan area was making sure that the so-called enablers things like evacuation capacity um, the, the medical uh, capacity the security at the airport was in place um, and we did all of that to make sure that we could shift from the green zone, as we did, to the airport in the 13th and 14th. Um, that's also why, just to give you a sense, we speeded up the relocation of former Afghan staff under the ARAC programme. We did that from April onwards. That's why we changed our travel advice in April. It's why the, the number of UK staff at the Kabul embassy was drawn down from 115 to 75 in May. Um, and. Uh, uh, so, so whilst the central assessment was the one I described, doesn't mean we weren't doing contingency planning or Scott Hall assessments. Can I then ask on the contingency plan very specifically, when did you last update the NEO for Afghanistan? When did we last update the, the non-combatant evacuation operation order for Afghanistan? Um, I, I'd have to check that, but I can tell you that we started planning in June for the contingency of, a, of a, an evacuation. Um, and therefore a drawdown, full drawdown of the embassy, um, notwithstanding the central assessment still remained. Uh, and of course, the timing on all of this was very much synchronised with what our fellow NATO allies were doing. So as well as the domestic process, we were docking in and checking and sense checking with our NATO allies about um, how they saw things running. And uh, as part of that, presumably, you knew how many British citizens were roughly, or entitled people, were roughly going to be requiring your services? Should well, I'm not sure that is true because of the combination, particularly in Afghanistan, uh, of, un uh, of not just documented passports to nationals who may be there travelling, seeing friends, backpacking, whatever it may be, but also, and this was one of the great challenges, um, the, the incidents of large families some of whom were documented mononationals, dual nationals perhaps, but none of that's documented. Others who had a less clear status, either because of their eligibility or because of the lack of documentation. So actually that's one of the reasons why it's been difficult to give a definitive uh, account of the number. I understand that. In that case, may I ask, um, because your assessment of the number of people requiring evacuation went from about 5,000 to about 15,000 who were evacuated. Could you tell me why you are confident of your numbers of those remaining in Afghanistan now? We're not confident with any precision at all, um, because for two reasons. No, we don't, we don't think that. We think that uh, in terms of nationals, uh, we're into the hundreds, uh, possibly the, the mid to low hundreds. But again, it depends on eligibility, which of course is one of the things that has been a challenge. What I would say this, is we got broadly, um, uh, uh, let me check the numbers so I give you exactly um, the, the right figure. We got um, uh, something like an estimate of 500 out between uh, April and uh, the 15th uh, of August. Um, and in terms of British nationals, uh, a further roughly 7,000 out 
during the um, period between the 15th and the 29th of August. Alicia, do you want to come? It was a quick question about coalition building. Um, so in terms of a coalition to prevent this outcome, a coalition to see the UK remain with our allies, what went so horribly wrong that only Turkey was willing to stand by the UK? And what could we have done to build a better coalition, to work with partners to build a coalition without the US? So I think this is one of the really important things to nail. Um, and one of the, I, I've said all along, I was uh, very keen that the Foreign Office had a reality check about some of the optimism bias, including the optimism bias, for example, that the Americans would change their mind. If you look at the February 2020 decision by the previous administration, and then you follow what was happening in the presidential election campaign, and then you followed what the signs were, and indeed then the decision uh, by the incoming Biden administration, I think one of the things I would say is uh, there was some wishful thinking uh, in some quarters internationally uh, that uh, the Biden administration would change or dramatically alter. And I always thought that, and I think this is correct and accurate, and I discussed this with Karen Pierce, that the election campaign had baked in a broad, not exact consensus about some finality to this. Um, but forgive me, I, I think with Biden, there was no question that he was going to leave. He's wanted to do that for 20 years. Uh, he's always been pushing Obama to leave. That has been Biden's sole purpose of foreign policy to get out of Afghanistan. Why couldn't we convince Germany, France, Norway, any of our other, other uh, allies, essentially, to form a new coalition on the ground, making up the numbers the Americans were going to take out? I think if you look at the military capacity proportionately that the US put in, and therefore the shortfall, I don't think there was any will or appetite. And again, um, don't get me wrong, Lisa, you're right, we checked it, uh, the Defence Secretary has talked about this. It was very clear uh, come the NATO summit uh, that I attended uh, uh, in the Foreign Minister's meetings that uh, partners would stick to the maxim that NATO went in together, they would adapt the mission together as they did in 2014, and they would exit together. So if I'm honest with you, Alicia, I don't think there was any viable uh, alternative coalition once the US decision had been taken. And again, I think... Uh, there needed to be some reality about that in the public discourse because it was clear to me uh, there were not going to be anyone that could backfill for the capacity that the US provided. And the US were unlikely to shift the, the parameters beyond a few months, and that's exa exactly what happened. Can I just follow that on? Immediately, with, given that's the case and given that you foresaw this, why is it that the French evacuated everybody they had and who was dependent on them and we were scrabbling around uh, with a huge press of crowds at the airport and sadly have left a lot of people behind. Well, I, I'm afraid the, the analogy uh, I don't think runs. I don't, I think you're, I don't think you're comparing uh, like for like. Um, but we, uh, we got out uh, 15, over 15,000 but in the last two weeks of August. Um, and of course, if you look back to April, uh, when we started to advise, we gave the travel advice that people should leave. We expedited the Arab... Uh, um, uh, set up and, and expedited the Arab uh, program. Uh, the reality was many Afghans, uh, so t between that, those two periods, 2,500 I think broadly um, uh, left, including Arab and British nationals. Uh, but the reality was, given the uh, scale of numbers that we have uh, and, the, and the size of our, um, uh, the, the nature of our population, not just the size of it, um, there were lots of people like, uh, who, who were taken su by surprise by the scale and the pace of the Taliban advance. And therefore they only came relatively late on. So we were doing everything we could and we got 2,500 out. But the lion's share, um, as, you, as you would know, came with the search for the door once it was evident that Kabul was likely to fall. Oh, you wanted to come on Thank quickly. You, Foreign Secretary, just for clarity's sake, you said in the past a couple of days that everyone was caught by surprise um, and that the intelligence was clearly wrong. Just in, in simple quiet. terms, why was that? Is it because we were being led by uh, an over-optimistic assessment from the US? Is that a collective failure on the part of the UK? Was the information different from the military as opposed to the diplomatic channels? Why did we get it so badly wrong? Um, I think there's a, a whole range of assumptions that, um, uh, one, the optimism bias about what the US might or might not do, um, uh, two, I think around the intent of the Taliban, uh, I always cautioned uh, that I thought the Taliban uh, were uh, unlikely, once the US decision to withdraw was clear, to engage uh, in particular meaningful dialogue around a more inclusive government. Uh, and. Uh, 
and seize the opportunity to take control. That relates to intent, the much bigger question whether they have the capacity to back up that intent. And I think in fairness, uh, that is something which uh, collectively, cross allies, uh, clearly the assessment that they uh, would not be able to advance at that speed was not correct. Um, and we'll need to look and assess uh, about why that's the case. Can you go any further on that today as to why and where you think, and this is about learning for the future, not just about finding scapegoats, about where that failure came from. You talked about optimism bias. Were there other factors think, you think that are relevant? Well, I want to be respectful. I, 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 you know, tested. I mean, I tested uh, the assessments and the evidence. And as I said, partly because of the history of the Foreign Office being accused of being uh, itself optim having an optimism bias, I wanted us to do the opposite. Um, but ultimately, we have got a very rigorous process, and uh, we'll have to look at, at, at how the assessments got wrong. I would offer one reflection, and it's no more than that. I think when you've been in a country like Afghanistan for 20 years and all the blood, sweat and tears and toil and all the sacrifice and there'll be people around this committee will know exactly what that means. I think there is a sense, a desire, an absolute determination to make it uh, work, to make things better and to, uh, and to believe that you can uh, complete the, the task. Um, I, I think there's a question at what point, and this goes back to 2001 right the way through, not an attempt to take responsibility off the last period in which this government's been in, but at what point do we really have clearly identified the military objectives, the means to achieve them, and a, a, a clear and coherent exit strategy? I think in fairness, that is something that was much debated at the time and in 2014 at the end of combat operations. But I, I think there does need to be uh, a, a consideration of, of how difficult it is when you're in a conflict for 20 years, emotionally if not, not, not anything else, it is to extract yourself. And, and because of that, despite the fact that you have plans, you were still caught slightly on the hop because of the intelligence failure, despite the best laid plans. Is that fair? Look, the, 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 we always try and, I think as politicians, certainly as ministers, um, and I'm sure across Whitehall, we try and uh, uh, aim out for, the, for these things. But uh, look, you asked me for reflection. Actually, I think uh, uh, we've got a very professional uh, way of approaching these things, but when they're wrong, and we've seen economic forecasts that are wrong, this is obviously a different order of things, but you need to look at how you correct that. Sorry, I was interested in your comment about exit plans. What's, what's the United States exit plan from South Korea? I, I don't know, um, okay. uh, but uh, you know, in, in fairness, uh, I, I don't think uh, that's a commensurable commitment, albeit uh, it's a very important one, having been up to the demilitarised uh, zone uh, and sp spoken to the commanders and looked across uh, the border. I, I don't think we see them uh, in harm's way, uh, certainly for many years, in the way that they've actively been in harm's way in Afghanistan. Because 20 years after the end of the Korean War, the United States still had thousands of troops in what was then a vicious military dictatorship with an economy uh, smaller than Afghanistan's and a broken state. Uh, but despite that, they endured and pushed through. But that may maybe that's another question. Chris. So as I understand it, and you'll correct me, I'm sure if I'm wrong, um, there was a majority intelligence view, which was that um, the Afghan forces would manage to hold on um, indefinitely, uh, or certainly for some period. Um, and then there was a minority view, um, which, for which you prepared a contingency plan, but you, were, but you started in June. And most of your eggs were in the majority view basket, and you had a few eggs in the minority view, which was that you might have to have a contingency. Is that right? I wouldn't put it quite like that. There's not a, it's not a question of the minority report. You have a central assessment, and you, of course, uh, uh, you have a, 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 a worst case scenarios which you contingency plan for as well. I think that's quite right. The Prime Minister said in the House of Commons on the 18th of August, what is not true is to say that the UK government were unprepared or did not foresee this, i.e. the collapse of Kabul and, and the Afghan forces, because it was certainly part of our planning. And I suppose then the charge is that you just didn't put enough effort into the contingency planning, isn't it? No, I think he, he's rightly identifying um, that uh, we had planned. Uh, let me, you know, again, we... Uh, we this was your plan. This is what you planned. No, no, it's why we um, focused in the run-up to the June G7 summit about the shift, the potential shift from the green zone to the airport. 
It's why we speeded up the relocation of former Afghan staff under the ARAP programme from April onwards, relocating nearly 2,000 during that period. It's why we changed our travel advice uh, in April. Well, um, let, let me just come to and that. And it's why, sorry, just to complete the picture, it's why we reduced the number of UK staff at the Kabul Embassy in May uh, from 115 to 75. So, but you, I mean, and that's the nature of dealing, catering with uh, a risk-based assessment. You have a central proposition, but you're also mindful of dealing with the worst case scenario, even if it's uh, not regarded as likely. But let me just take you through some dates. The US had left the two main air bases in Kandahar and Bagram by the 2nd of July. On the 8th of July, several MPs in the House of Commons told the Prime Minister um, that the Taliban were likely to take large parts of the country. On the 14th of July, the Taliban had seized all the major border crossings into Tajikistan, Iran and Pakistan. On the 21st of July, the US said that the Taliban had seized half the country. But we only, you only, changed the travel advice for British nationals going to Afghanistan on the 6th of August. No, it's not quite true. Um, in April, we changed our travel advice to uh, advise British nationals to consider leaving Afghanistan. We changed it again to make it even more stringent in August. Um, we started in June, notwithstanding the central assessment, the uh, the, the contingency plans for a military-led evacuation, which is the, the big shift. And it's worth just saying uh, that commercial flights were still running uh, up until the 14th of August, even after we changed the travel advice on the 6th of August that you cited. Okay. On the 11th of August, the US said that the Taliban were likely to seize the whole country. It was just a question of how long it was going to take. Were you already on holiday? So, by the way, the, the, you know, that is part of the central assessment that I described, uh, that we thought that they would seize. Uh, or, I mean, there, there are basically a, a variety of uh, scenarios between Taliban takeover and civil war. But the most likely, the central assessment, was that it would be uh, a Taliban consolidation of power, uh, but that it would take uh, place in the months following the evacuation, and that... Uh, that Kabul would not fall before the end of the year. You didn't ask, answer my, the second half of my I, question. I, Were you already on I, holiday I, on the I 11th of August? I've given a, a, a full statement on my holiday. I've said that I wouldn't have gone uh, um, uh, away with the benefit of hindsight, which is uh, the luxury of commentary. When did not, you go on I'm holiday? I'm not going to start, Chris, adding to, frankly, the... the uh, fishing expedition uh, beyond the facts that I've articulated in a fulsome statement and having answered questions uh, continuously about that. I would just make the broader point. No, no, no. no well, I'm sorry, Mr. Raab. The problem here is that, of course, it's perfectly legitimate for ministers to go on holiday. Everybody has that right. And in, I would argue it's an important part of people being fresh enough to be able to do their job properly. The difficulty for us is that the Prime Minister was on holiday. Um, the Deputy Prime Minister, yourself, was on holiday, and as I understand it, the Permanent Under Secretary was on holiday, all three at the same time, when British nationals were at risk. Many people, thousands of people, by your own estimation, who stood by us in a difficult time in Afghanistan, were in peril of their lives, and there was still not a proper um, crisis centre up in place. Do you not see that it's important for British people to understand why you thought it was right to go on holiday? No, sorry, I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't uh, agree with that analysis. Of course I've been clear with the benefit of hindsight, I wouldn't have gone away at all. Um, uh, the, the charge in relation to officials I think is particularly unwarranted because we always make sure that we have uh, the right cover in place. The Permanent Secretary did an excellent job uh, and quite right given uh, all of the IR, the SR, the merger, uh, that he should uh, take some leave. Uh, in terms of um, uh, my own situation, I'll just say this, I'm travelling today. Uh, a modern foreign secretary has to have the ability, given those wider range of issues that will constantly bubble up, possibly to crisis point, to be able to deal, act, work uh, uh, from uh, abroad. I engaged in all of the COBRA meetings. Uh, I engaged and directed the emergency response team uh, uh, directly, uh, and uh, I was engaged with international partners. So the, uh, 
the, the and, and the truth is, Chris, judge us by the results. Because between the, yeah. well, the, we'll 15th, come on to those. Hold on, the 15th of August and the end of August, we delivered over 15,000 people out of the country, which I think is the uh, certainly the most challenging uh, evacuation of its kind in living memory. On results, can you tell us how many people you think, both UK nationals and their families, and then the people who might qualify um, because they worked for UK forces, and then thirdly, the, the extremely vulnerable. What do you think, what is your best estimate of those numbers? And I fully accept that you're not going to be able to give, yeah. you know. So there's three categories, you're right. Um, in terms of nationals, we got through the overwhelming majority of nationals that we could verify eligibility. Numbers. Sorry, I've given you the number that we... No, no, but you also answered the question, you said you weren't confident of the numbers, so I'm just wondering... So I'm not confident in the numbers remaining, but we think that they would be in the low hundreds. Why? What do you mean by low hundreds? Do you mean 110 sort of area, or do you mean 200, 300, 400? They will be in the low hundreds, um, but I, I, I don't, I'm very reticent about giving a firm figure precisely because we don't know. One of the... Re but, but low hundreds sounds that it could be 400... Or it could be 105, 110, 115. And, and if I could give you any more precision, Chris, I would. But let me explain. Somewhere between 100 and 500. So let me explain and why. UK it's nationals. So let me explain why it's difficult. Because we got most of the, uh, if not all of the mono nationals who were documented who wanted to leave out, and we're left with some it has to be said, a significant proportion applying who could not establish their nationality, but also a category of more complex cases, particularly with significant wider families, where one or other may have documented nationality or can demonstrate it, others and the concentric circles of immediacy of their dependents yeah. couldn't, and that's why it's difficult. In relation to Arab, I think the MOD have, uh, and the Defence Secretary have put an assessment out and then you asked about the third category, the more vulnerable. So you accept that number? I think their number they're giving is between 150 and 250? The MOD? Yes. Well, look, I, I, I defer to the Defence Secretary on the, well, on the Arab number. This, this is a major problem, it seems to me, about the whole way the government's approached this, which is that you've had three separate channels. Every MP, every MP has had individuals coming to their constituency surgeries or ringing them up or emailing them desperate about family members in Afghanistan, some of them UK nationals, some of them who might qualify under Arab, and some of them who might qualify under the sort of special cases, very vulnerable people um, system. But nobody knows, why is there no triage system? Why have three different departments where you can't even speak on behalf of the MOD on how many people under Arab are so still two, outstanding? There's, there's two different things. The Arab program was set up by the MOD and the Home Office. It's right that they confirm those figures. You're right to refer to three different categories of case. We have uh, one of the reasons uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, FCDO was criticised the emergency centre was because precisely because we were seeking to triage uh, the three types of case. The reason there's three types of case is there's three grounds for eligibility to come to this country. One is you're a British national. That requires evidence of something very... You, will you shake it? Yeah. No, no, I agree. Okay. I agree. Okay. And, and, can I finish and, the... Can and I for that the, matter, <coughs> sorry, but for that matter, lots of families might have somebody in all three categories, Ab which is why a single system would surely be more, far more effective. Well, no, because the criteria, the threshold, and the evidence for what counts as nationality is very different from the Arab scheme and the criteria that we work through and, uh, and is a risk-based... Uh, set of criteria for those that have worked for us and shown loyalty to us. And, this, and the third category is a, a, a sec, a, essentially um, a based on international law and is, a, again, a vulnerability, a, 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 an asylum-related uh, set of criteria. Those are all three different thresholds. Can you not see why that might seem um, to the people who are experiencing it, like the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing, and departmentalise us writ large. Can I, can I just push And people being that? treated as numbers rather than hu no, I humans. Think, I think uh, we would be uh, remiss if we weren't prioritising, and this is a form of prioritising according to the three categories that matter most. British nationals, of course we must do everything for them and their dependents. Secondly, those that worked for us, and we need to have a definition of that. And thirdly, because we've announced that we will be taking under the resettlement scheme 5,000 this year, leading up to a total of 20,000. Uh, and those will be based on objective, independent, national related criteria for those that are at risk of persecution. It is precisely because 
we need to, as well as uh, demonstrate the huge compassion that we as a country are doing, but also have criteria to make sure that those that we want to come, come, rather than just opening the door and saying, actually, we're going to uh, uh, have an unstructured approach to this, which, if I took what you're saying to its logical conclusion, I think would undermine public confidence in the system. I, I think we're doing everything we can, and the proof is in the 17,000 that since April we have secured safe passage back to the UK. And I'm very happy to talk through uh, uh, those numbers and the cases and the achieving scholars and the female judges and the journalists that we have taken yeah. to safety. We, we know, obviously, that there's a significant number of people who have not got out. I think you're accepting that, yes? Look, in in number, the several thousands. Any number that we haven't got out uh, because of the uh, evacuation and the, uh, the situation uh, is, 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 is too many. Yeah, so I... I I understand the point you're making, but basically there's a significant number. Have you put a number on that of how many people you think um, we have left behind? Well, it's the same. You're answering, asking the same question a different way. Uh, and I just said, I, I can't give you a definitive... And by the way, the other thing is... not Okay, all but it's just that the Prime Minister said that the overwhelming majority of the people who um, owed us, uh, who st stood by in us, in other yeah. words, people who worked for us, the overwhelming majority of them are out. Yeah. But if you're not confident of the numbers, how can the Prime Minister possibly know whether the overwhelming majority are out or not? I'm not confident with precision to be able to give you a set number, but I am confident that the Prime Minister's right that we've got the overwhelming number out. Okay. What, our, what our focus on is now is how, given the facts on the ground, we get as many people uh, to safety uh, in a structured way um, and in a, in a way that doesn't put them uh, at risk. Okay. And I think one of the reasons that lots of MPs are troubled by this is because we had Nigel Adams before us last year um, when we had to evacuate an awful lot of people because of COVID from all sorts of different places around the world. And it just feels as if the Foreign Office hasn't learnt anything from that. Can I address that square on? Yeah. I looked very carefully, and I take this committee very seriously, uh, and your July 2020 report uh, from the repatriation effort on COVID, we took very seriously. By the way, the consular team did an incredible job during the COVID crisis getting people back home. And we worked night and day. Uh, we learned a lot on things like the call centre. We learned a lot on the scalability. Uh, your committee, uh, Chris and uh, Mr Chair, uh, made a number of points about the ability to scale up quickly, for example. Uh, as a result, we established a contingency planning team uh, within the crisis management department. And uh, we established the crisis response to the Afghanistan situation on the 11th of August. It doubled in size and scale of civilian staff from 70 on day one to 146 on day three, again to 358 on day six, 510 on day nine, and uh, hit a peak of 581 on day 11. You, you also talked about- That's all in the UK, yes? Say again? Yes. Yeah. staff are all in the That's UK. That's the crisis response team. You also uh, talked about, Tom, the shifting the communication pattern. You felt it was too passive and it wasn't active uh, enough, particularly on social media. So as a result of that, we put in place the structures to uh, provide uh, more proactive advice, including outsourcing to a call handling provider for immediate support for our contact center. We had a team of 45 consular staff from around the SEO network deployed to take calls alongside our contact center. Uh, we had an extra 35 staff from the HMRC. The other one that uh, I thought was important, you said there was an over-reliance on commercial flights. By the way, I personally think you're wrong about that in relation to COVID. I think it was right to try and get uh, the uh, huge number we did back on commercial flights to free up the space on the charters. But in any event, even if I disagreed, I looked at your recommendations very carefully. So as a result, we now have a contract with CTM uh, and are using it for our charter flights, or did use it for our charter flights, and that allowed us to get planes arranged quickly, departing within two days of the beginning of operations. So feel free to criticise, but first of all, we did learn the lessons from the point at which you spoke to Nigel, and we did take the recommendations of this committee very seriously. I mean, I've just got one more question, which is um, the Prime Minister's well, I texted you with more details of another case today, a British national who's in Afghanistan. And I, I, I don't want, I'm not going to go into the individual issues. Um, I know he's spoken very passionately on television about how, what a desperate situation he's in. And every MP will have had cases like this. 
Um, we've all been running around trying to find different means of getting people out, including lots of people on this committee. Um, and we are grateful to um, you personally and to, and to everybody in the Foreign Office and, and who's been involved in all of this. But what we're now really anxious about is the people who are left. And the Prime Minister said that he was going to move heaven and earth um, to get them out. What advice would you be giving to people now, for instance, members of the Hazara community who are effectively facing a genocide, um, self-declared by the Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, to individuals who work for us who are still stuck there, British nationals who are still stuck there. What, what's the advice? Go to the border? So can I, can I walk you through where we are with the third country planning? Because I think it's more than just give X or Y uh, advice. And by the way, can I also say that in terms of the special cases, so-called special cases, we did get out 58 evening scholars and their dependents, 287 journalists, 68, 65 women's rights activists, um, 11 members of the of government, 42 law enforcement uh, officials, 37 extremely vulnerable individuals, <coughs> nine judges um, uh, and others besides. In terms of the third country planning, uh, there, are, there are a number of stages. First, we need to be able to secure safe passage uh, out of Afghanistan, at least until that point at which Kabul airport is up and running, at which case uh, things will change materially. Uh, we have sought and secured direct assurances uh, that we can do that for our nationals and indeed the people that work for us. And you would have noticed that we uh, led the way with France and the US uh, to secure a UN Security Council resolution requiring it. Now, of course, that broadens the international <coughs> community's leverage on the Taliban to try and exercise pressure. So that's the first thing. Secondly, we've identified the countries uh, most likely uh, to be the port of call or destination for those leaving. Um, there's a whole range of them, and between myself and Lord Ahmed, we've spoken to all of the foreign ministers to be clear that they will be, uh, in the right circumstances, allowed through. Third, we focused on the documents required uh, to allow people to cross that border into the third country, whether it's a note of a ballot or some other means of our ambassador or high commissioner informing the border authorities, this individual we will take. Uh, then, um, We've, and I've just sent out, they'll arrive in the next 36 hours, uh, a rapid deployment team of 15 people who will service those, uh, those areas where we expect uh, people will head for. Uh, that will include Pakistan, Uzbekistan, T Tajikistan and, and others. Um, fifth, um, we've obviously got to look very carefully at the security checks uh, in relation to that. And I'm working that through the Home Secretary and the Home Office uh, in real time. We spoken last night and this morning as well on it. Uh, I'm going to the regime tonight uh, and uh, to test uh, the accessibility of these arrangements. Uh, and of course, as you mentioned, uh, Heiko Mass has been to Uzbekistan, but we've got to keep those uh, borders open. But I think part of that is giving those third countries uh, arrangements that they can feel confident in, and perhaps support as well. And then finally, just to say on Monday, uh, the G7 uh, Turkey, Qatar, the NATO U Secretary General uh, had a meeting, uh, of course, which I joined, about this importance of keeping airports open for third uh, countries uh, and this issue of safe passage. So both in terms of the granular arrangements we're making, but also the international uh, concerted action, uh, that's in place. In, in terms of the answer to your question, what we will get to you, uh, through travel advice and otherwise, is the signposting so that you can give that advice. And it will be directly there for individuals from all of those different countries, including the one you mentioned. Now, just very briefly, I know you're going to go to the region. Uh, clearly, this isn't the time to be making best friends. It would be great to have them earlier. Uh, is this your first trip to Pakistan? Uh, I've been to Pakistan before. As Foreign Secretary? But no, not as Foreign Secretary. The truth is, uh, I was hoping to go, but COVID... Yeah. Um, uh, has inhibited travel for quite a while, as you, you'll understand. Indeed. Uh, Neil, you, oh, sorry, forgive me, Alyssa, you want to come in very briefly. Yeah, and then. Just a very quick one. You mentioned those sorry, to, to, to be fine, but of course, as I mentioned, uh, Lord Ahmed was there in June, saw sure. uh, Prime Minister Khan, saw uh, Foreign Minister Qureshi. Uh, Foreign Secretary, you mentioned there were 510 Foreign Office staffers in the UK. How many were on the ground? Because the issue was not planes, it was processing. Uh, the Baron Hotel was an extremely vulnerable point before the terror attack. 
Uh, I have families outside 36 hours, 48 hours, an unconscious baby for two hours who only got into Barron Hotel because friends helped me get the military outside the compound to drag that family in and get that girl on the saline drip. How many staff do we have on the ground and why wasn't processing quicker? Because that was the hold up. Sorry, Lucy, I want, I want to answer your question really fully. I, I'm not clear when you're talking. Now, we clearly don't. Yeah. At the time of the processing, in the last the two weeks that we've all spent desperately trying to get people out, how many foreign office staff were on the ground processing we in peaked Barron at, Hotel? We peaked at 20, uh, and of course, just to be clear, you absolutely need the front-facing uh, staff, but the, the decision-making was via the SCDO uh, crisis response team because you could get the uh, decision makers at the senior level there and you could integrate them in terms of the SEDO consular people, the border force people, the UK VIS people uh, and also the military planners. I'm very happy to take you through the scalability of what we did given uh, the Taliban advance on Kabul and I'm happy to answer questions on what we did in relation to the explosion but um, we, we peaked at 20 plus there were uh, 13 border force staff. But the, 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 um, the, the principal issue at, at all material times, I would say, between the 14th, 15th and the end of August, has been the issue of stability and security around the airport so we could bolster that capacity. I do think, for some of the nonsense that I've read in the papers, if I may say, mm -hmm. the suggestions that we should have been putting people uh, in uh, when the, the airport was not secure, when the powers and the American forces had not secured that airport, when we just had an ISIS-K attack, uh, literally a stone's throw from the, Bo uh, the Barron's Hotel processing centre, I do find rather irresponsible. But we uh, had an incredibly courageous bunch of MOD, Home Office and SEDO civilian staff, and I feel, uh, I hope you don't mind saying, quite protective about some of the nonsense that's been said. They put themselves under uh, conditions of incredible pressure and uh, a measure of risk to themselves that many of their critics, uh, I'm afraid, have not. I, I can speak for the whole committee and say that the gratitude that we have for yeah. the civilians and soldiers who served our country with enormous dignity and courage in Afghanistan is not something that this committee would run away from. We are, on the contrary, hugely proud of them and extremely grateful for this. I was service. also talking, Tom, about the civilian staff. I said civilian yeah. staff as well. Forgive me, I didn't see that. So, so I was a member of the Rapid Deployment Team at the Foreign Office. You are trained specifically to do NEOs. You are trained to be in the most vulnerable, collapsing crisis. My question is, we didn't send out RDT teams until the 17th of August, is that correct? Uh, let me walk you through the, uh, the details of that. Uh, the decision to withdraw SCDO staff uh, on the 13th, was on the 13th of August. Um, we, of, of course, the ambassador remained. By the way... Was he instructed to remain or did he choose to remain? No, no, was, uh, there's no question of telling him to do something that, that he uh, was not able to do. I, and I, of course, um, uh, talked it through with him in a professional way. No one has been more courageous, um, uh, with the exception of the forces on the ground, uh, than Laurie Bristow in, in terms of the civilian presence. Um, the, by the way, the, 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 the decision was based on a military assessment of risk. Just to be absolutely clear about this, the decision to take some of our, uh, the lion's share, frankly, of our uh, crisis response team on the ground, uh, the civilian element, uh, to Dubai, was based on a military assessment of risk. And indeed, uh, civilian uh, personnel from the MOD left on the same flight. Uh, the ambassador remained. Um, the SCDO staff were only taken to Dubai so we could get back as they did on the 17th of August. Uh, when we went back in, just to be clear, and I'm not pointing uh, 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 fingers, but the border force staff didn't arrive until later that week, but that's because we were all operating to the same assessment of military risk on the ground. And as from you all know, I think it is right when there's a risk to life or limb to defer to that. But um, if the RDT team deployed on the 17th of August, why was it not considered safe for them to go before that point? Because they are, you constantly have a full RDT team on deployment, ready to go within an hour's notice at all times. So we got them this. back in on the 17th, um, uh, uh, so that you know there was a four-day period. And the truth is, that, 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 this is the, the Paris and the US forces had not arrived in full and secured that airport until then. And we got them back in um, on, on the ground on the 17th. They were bolstered again to a peak of 20 plus 13 border force staff. In addition, we had this uh, a further RDT of seven in Dubai. Uh, and as, as we've already gone through, over 200 staff 
at the SDDO Crisis Centre working 24-7 to coordinate the response. Um, if the question, Alicia, is were they somehow reticent uh, no, all, there's no question that they were reticent at uh, all. And, and there was no, the only logistical issue, uh, or the, 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 not the only, there are lots of logistical issues. Um, the principal logistical issue was the safety of that airport for them to be able to do the job. And indeed, as you know, in the processing centre, you're asking people to come forward. And the processing centre, as, as, as you have seen from the footage around the terrorist attack, was outside the airport. So on top of securing the airport, we also needed to know that the processing centre at Barron's Court was safe. I cannot put people into harm's way at risk of losing their life. Uh, we do it with soldiers and they, uh, their heroism is uh, rightly lauded. But with civilian staff, we have to take the assessment of military risk on the ground. And that is what quite professionally we did. But I think that's the crux of the question. We all agree it was vulnerable. The whole point is therefore getting Afghans and British nationals into Baron Hotel at speed, which is what wasn't happening. That was the issue. That's where the risk set But it wasn't safe. Sorry, it it wasn't secure. On. Forgive me, I'm going to move on because Neil Cole wants to come yeah. in. And you've and, said and, and, I'm sick of the process and, and safety. There were 18 months to prepare, prepare for evacuation and you've just said today that you, in the last six months you had 40 meetings about evacuation in a high-risk situation and yet we ended up with a position where three different government departments ran three different helplines and hotlines which were not being answered and your department had a, a, an Afghan special cases email address that wasn't even being opened in life and death cases. Who is responsible for that chaos on the ground? Well, I don't accept that categorisation. I'm happy to go over any of those issues uh, in terms of the emails uh, or anything else. Uh, Please the, do. The, the, the rea well, I can, I can address the email issue, but the, first of all, the reality is we secured uh, over 15,000 people out. Okay, okay you've said that, and you want to be plaudited for those who got out, but there are 9,000 no, estimated left behind. Who is taking responsibility for helplines and, and the email address in your department not even being opened? So the, the issue as you had a surge for the door is that you had a surge of uh, emails, including uh, late emails and, and, and requests like that. But let me just explain the situation for, for, for you, Neil, just for, for, purely for transparency. We've got the three types of cases. They, they, you know, m melding them all in together, I, frankly... And, and countries that didn't use three different cases... Can I answer your question, have, have got, You're not answering your question. You're going back to the question from, a, from, a, from, I, from I really Chris Bryant. But, but other countries that use one process, South Korea, France, other examples, they got people out. Other countries, so, they, Neil, other well, examples in well, Lebanon in 2006, Neil, Neil, we used Neil, one what process you're is wrong. For, for an evacuation. All countries were focused in one way or another on evacuating based on nationality, people that worked for them, and other vulnerable cases, particularly those with an affinity towards them. They all faced that, that challenge, and I don't believe uh, the, that any of the countries with the, the types of cases, particularly family cases, but others, uh, uh, fared uh, uh, better, and I think those comparisons... Well, they're reporting well. that they did, and, and you can't even tell us today how many people are left behind, abandoned by the UK government after 20 years of service. Now, that includes, and can you tell us today whether the Afghan guards from the British Embassy in Kabul have been evacuated or not? They were held up due to paperwork problems. Well, um, Are they here? We, we, we wanted to get um, some of those embassy guards uh, Are they here? through... But the buses arranged to collect them, to take them to the airport, weren't given permission to, 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 to enter. Um, and that is, I'm afraid, a reflection of the conditions on the ground. We will, of course, which comes back to the third country, uh, uh, arrangements. They were held up due to paperwork. So, so let's, let, let's stick with some of this, because the Defence well, Secretary, sorry, let's stick with the same issue, because true. you can't say whether they're here or not, it sounds Neil. like. So, so you're not answering the question, so allow me to move on. Neil. The Defence Secretary, who Neil. I think is credited by most Neil. as having worked his socks off through this crisis, you well, well like. you're not answering the question, France Secretary, so let's move on. The Defence Secretary said it was not good enough to leave details of UK-linked Afghans in the British Embassy, as was reported in the Times. Um, do you agree with that assessment? And who is taking responsibility for that security and safety risk for those nationals? So let me talk you through the, do the this is the documentation. Uh, the first thing to say in relation to uh, the uh, situation is, of course, uh, it is uh, regrettable. Uh, it reflects, I think it's fair to say, the pressure on the ground. We had a five-day uh, scheduled uh, approach for closure of the embassy and it got caught brought forward because of the situation on the ground. I have nonetheless um, asked for uh, a, a, um, a full uh, review of, as to what happened to make sure we can learn the lessons. But just to be clear, we, uh, it was the times that um, uh, 
uh, broke this story or, or revealed this story, uh, they shared the names with us. We moved rapidly to evacuate the three families uh, from Kabul within 24 hours. And all of those whose names the Times passed to us uh, and who worked for us are now in the UK. So uh, That's good. And they, but they should never have been at risk. So the, 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 the general, the Lord Dan has said, as former chief of staff, that you were asleep at the helm. So can I just ask, do you owe those Afghan nationals and those British troops who have flown into a more dangerous situation late an apology for the circumstances that they have faced? I think we owe them every effort to uh, get the, those out that we did, over 17,000 since April, and now to focus on the new reality in Afghanistan with the arrangements that we're working on at speed, which is why I'm going to the region shortly, with our international partners, which is what I've been doing all week, to get uh, those that remain out as swiftly, as safely, and as responsibly as possible. No apology has been heard. So can I ask, do you owe the Prime Minister an apology? Because I believe you promised that the portrait of the, Her Majesty would not be left in the British Embassy. So what went so badly wrong? And is our Queen and our country less safe as a result of the Taliban takeover? As, uh, I was the first, uh, I have to say, that I've heard reported that uh, the portrait of the Queen was left in the Embassy. My understanding was that uh, that was destroyed. Are you saying that it wasn't? From Talibs with the portrait of the Queen. Right. Well, we, we had a very clear, in fact, I, I, I talked through with the team the um, uh, the, the policy for destroying not just documents but anything relating to HMG. It's not clear to me whether that came from outside or inside the embassy. Clearly we were conscious of the attempted propaganda coup around um, uh, uh, Taliban taking over embassies and, and, uh, uh, and what have you. The, the reality is we haven't seen an attack from Afghanistan, terrorist attack on the West uh, in 20 years and what we've now got to focus on which our Security Council resolution which the UK is at the forefront driving forward uh, uh, focuses on is making sure that we continue to exercise the maximum leverage on the Taliban we possibly can. It's worth also saying that the ISIS-K attack uh, on Abbey Gate uh, also appears to have been targeted at Taliban as well as US and others. Very briefly Alicia. Um, under what circumstances will the UK be recognised the Taliban and what sort of recognition do you foresee? And as part of that, what is your assessment of the relationship between the Taliban, the faction we're dealing with, and uh, Al-Qaeda? Well, um, first of all, we do not recognise governments generally. Um, uh, but I think it's also important not to confer any legitimacy on the Taliban. At the same time, we do need to be able to send clear and direct signals. We've done that. Uh, for some time via their political commission, which has been based in Doha. We now have Simon Gass, uh, the Prime Minister's special envoy in the region, to ensure that we can do that. And we want to have as much continuity um, uh, in our diplomatic presence as possible. We want to be in a position, when the safety and the security allows, to have a, a, a con continuity of diplomatic presence uh, in Afghanistan. But clearly that's not possible right now. And, and your last question was? Al-Qaeda and their, their relationship with the faction, the Taliban, who seem to be in negotiations with... Well, I think, I, I, look, I think there are all sorts of tensions within the Taliban and uh, even more acute uh, factionalism between them and the groups. And as I mentioned before, ISIS-K appears to have been targeting the Taliban as well as others at the Abbey Gate. Um, and so I, I think, uh, first of all, uh, the Taliban has been clear uh, it's made these assurances publicly, it will not give succour or haven to terrorist groups. The UN Security Council resolution backed that up, it's important, because although it was only acquiesced in by China and Russia, it is the beginning of the contours of a new set of parameters which will exercise greater pressure and hopefully maximum moderating leverage on the Taliban. But look, these are early days and we need to set credible and realistic tests for the Taliban and engage with them on the basis of whether or not they follow through. Sorry, even as the UN is debating that, we've had credible reports of biometric data left behind in Afghanistan being used to target and murder former NDS staff. So um, forgive me if I'm doubtful as to the level of leverage that we may end up being able to achieve. Um, I know you shared doubts as well, so I won't go any further. Stuart, you wanted to come in and then I'll go to Graham. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks, Foreign Secretary, for your time this afternoon. Um, have you been to Afghanistan as Foreign Secretary previously? No. No. Um, your own actions and leadership have come under intense scrutiny. I don't want to go into all the holiday um, 
stuff, but I do want to understand how your own actions correspond with the advance of the Taliban uh, across the country, who you spoke to, when you spoke to them. So if we could go back to August 6th, when uh, Zaranj, the capital of the Nimruz province, fell, who did you speak to then? Right. Look, I'm, I'm very happy. I've got a whole call sheet here. Um, but the, the reality was, in terms of, to give you the, 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 the clear uh, approach I was taking, that at all of these points, the most critical thing was to be engaged with our allies, NATO, uh, G7, regional allies, to try and uh, assess and influence uh, what was going on on the ground and to plan accordingly. So as that happened on the ground, who did you talk to that day? I, I, I would have to get back to you on the specific dates and... Uh, so, yeah, I, why don't you use, we'll do a mop-up in the usual way. So if I was to go through right now all of the various days where more and more of the country uh, has fallen to Taliban rule right now, you wouldn't be able to tell me who you talked to on what date, because your own actions have come under intense scrutiny up to the point of calls for resignation and accusations of being missing in action. And I think it's really important that we understand that as the situation got worse and worse and worse, what the Foreign Secretary was doing and who he was talking to, beyond vague, uh, and, I, and I don't doubt you were talking to uh, people, but beyond vague lines such as talking to G7 partners, NATO partners, and all the rest of it, because you have a very specific allegation laid to you that even after the fall of Kabul, you hadn't even talked to the UK ambassadors in the surrounding countries for five days. Is that correct? But look, so first of all, when did you talk to the? Sorry, let, when did you talk to the British asking, ambassadors? The, the, you're making a bunch countries. of assertions. Let me let me give you. I, look, the as I said before, the advice from the ambassadors. Uh, and they will often attend the, uh, the calls or the meetings we have internally with mm -hmm. the Foreign Office Crisis Centre is distilled down so we have uh, a single, complete, holistic view. Uh, I was uh, engaged with the SEDO Crisis Response Team, including the Director and the Director General, uh, on the COBRA meetings, uh, including, of course, with, with Laurie. Uh, and uh, the, frankly, your point about NATO FMs, uh, the NATO meetings, the G7 meetings, these were critical. I'm going to come back, I'm going to come back to that. When, when did you talk sorry, to the UK ambassador to Pakistan? Sorry, because... Uh, what, what date did you talk to the UK ambassador to Pakistan? I, I look, again, the, the idea that I would ring up every uh, ambassador rather than taking a... Uh, you said you take the committee seriously. You must have known this question was coming. Well, look, I, I wouldn't presume to guess what question you may want to ask. We get telegrams in uh, updating us on events uh, as everyone that has worked at the Foreign Office, Chris, will know, we assess them very carefully. Um, I don't need to pick up the phone to get an assessment from the ground. What I do need to do is, is get a holistic picture from the team who are getting all the different advice and get the options and assess what we do next. So on the 10th of August, a new border crossing opens up for the Taliban to Iran. Had you talked to the British ambassador to Iran at that point? So, so, by the way, all of the military developments on the ground, of course I was updated on, but, but principally... I'm, I'm guessing you didn't. Was so the accusation happened? that you hadn't spoke, spoken to ambassadors who serve under you as foreign secretary for a long time, as the situation got worse and worse and worse, no, I, uh, you hadn't spoken to Her Majesty's government's representatives in those neighbouring capitals. No, uh, that's nonsense because I... So tell me when you talked to them. Uh, what you're saying is, is not correct because we constantly have the feedback and the advice coming through the, the central response team. Uh, ambassadors will join those meetings as it's relevant. For example, if there's a particular issue, we need to hear directly from them. It's the same uh, mm. in the COBA meetings. And the, 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 uh, the lion's share of my effort was working with not just critical regional partners like uh, uh, Turkey, Qatar, but also what is the allied position in response to this? That Those discussions were happening within NATO, within G7 sure. and within the other areas. Um, so can, I, can I just understand, because I, I, I've listened carefully to what you said in media interviews and what else about the various calls that you were engaged in as you were on holiday and much like Mr Bryant, I, I think it's important that, that people do take holidays, but it's also important to know when to cut them short. Again, for the sake of transparency of your own actions, when did you go on holiday? What dates did you go on holiday? I Not mean, interested in what you I, did there. What date did you go? Look, I, I made a full statement. What date did you go on holiday, I, Foreign Secretary? I made a full statement. I think your own personal transparency is important. What date I, did you go on holiday? I made a full statement on it. Uh, I also was clear I should have... Did the statement include the date that you left and the country? At all material times, 
Why, can, why can't you just answer this question? This I, is absurd. Because, look, uh, to be honest with you, I think it's a pretty partisan political... I, I just want to know when you and went as holiday. I've been clear... Because I, I think it's important we can map out, you know, as Mr Bryan correctly said earlier, we have UK personnel, UK civilians in harm's way. And I think it's important for us to know what you were doing and, and where I, you were doing it from. And, when and did you go on holiday? And, and are all materials... I'm not right? looking to browbeat you over this. I just want to know when you went. It seems... Uh, when did you go on holiday? With the, with the facts. I think... The, what, I, okay. what I've said to you is... I'm getting means? nowhere on this. In terms of NATO discussions, now there was... The Defence Secretary has said that as the US was leaving, he had tried to speak to other NATO members to see if there was uh, some kind of arrangement that could uh, be created to supplement the absence of the US. What has not been clear is when did you or the Prime Minister speak to the NATO General Secretary about that possibility? Oh, I was in, I mean, again, I can come back to you with a specific date, but uh, at the NATO foreign ministers' meetings and in constant bilateral and uh, other NATO calls, including with the Secretary General, uh, and indeed from well before, uh, even under the previous Trump administration, we were having these conversations. I think the Defence Secretary is absolutely right to check this in the way um, I described to Alicia, but there was no credible uh, alternative alliance. There just wasn't. Any suggestions to the contrary, I'm afraid, are not borne out. It was right. So you're saying that was fully explored? I, yes, of course it was. It, and the reason was, and the Secretary General said it, and NATO allies said it uh, consistently, NATO went into Afghanistan together, they adapted the mission together from 2014, and they would withdraw together. And there were very few meaningful departures from that view. Why did it take so long to convene the G7? Uh, I, I, it, it, why do you, I don't accept that it did. It, so the fall of Kabul happens on the 15th, G7 meets on the 24th. Look, everyone was dealing with the immediate situation on the ground. Um, we had, uh, you're referring, I think, to the leaders' meeting. Is that, is that correct? Yes. There was a G7 foreign ministers' meeting before that. And are you happy? Are you content with the outcome of the, the leaders' meeting? Well, we circulated a paper uh, that has uh, received, uh, I think, very widespread uh, support for setting out a range of priorities. Safe passage. So we've all got a similar problem. There's no country, I think, that uh, or certainly in the conversations I've had, uh, that isn't wanting to make sure that we can make sure that we can get any remaining UK uh, uh, citizens plus uh, Afghans at work first and other vulnerable account. The, the issue of counter-terrorism, clearly important. How do we exercise maximum leverage over the Taliban not to give succor or safe haven to any terrorist groups? I think there's a whole question around regional stability and the humanitarian lifeline. There's an issue here. Will the, um, will the Taliban, as many say, wish to reach out to try and get access to the international financial institutions and to aid, in which case they will have to pass certain tests. One of them obviously will be uh, a safe working environment within Afghanistan um, for uh, uh, UN and humanitarian groups to operate because there's no way uh, we would uh, Sounds like you are content we would give money to the, the, the Taliban. Meeting. Well, no, it's a first step, as was the UN Security Council resolution. But we've got to face well, this. Well, and that's, pretty, that's pretty weak as well, is it not? I think it's... In terms of the ambition pretty, pretty of the remarkable. outcome. No, I think, no. It's pretty remarkable uh, in these conditions, in these circumstances, with all the tensions that are well known uh, amongst Security Council members, to get a Security Council resolution, uh, which at least has been acquiesced by Russia and China, in Durand the Council as well. But the key thing is going to be broadening that out, so you have not just a P5 and the Security Council set of uh, uh, buy-in, but you've also then got some of the regional players, uh, the big donors that we'll need, given the uh, humanitarian system. Uh, system. But, but the one point I was going to make is that the Taliban has a choice here. Um, it is, uh, and people on its behalf are professing that they uh, want to behave a different way. Um, uh, they, they will not want to see the gains, uh, certainly not that the economic and social structure, such as it is, totally collapse. And therefore, there is an opportunity to test uh, how seriously they want to continue to have lines and ties out to the, uh, the international community. If they want aid, we'll have to see a safe operating environment. Uh, within Afghanistan, we wouldn't give it to the Taliban, um, and there's a whole range of other asks around human rights, particularly protecting women. I suspect, I suspect we'll come to all that, but I'm conscious of time, and I know that other colleagues want to go in. I just have one very last question, uh, Chair. In terms of your own uh, leadership and your own actions up until this point, did you ever at any point consider or offer to resign? 
no, I considered getting on with the job of uh, what has been a Herculean uh, uh, task of getting 17,000 people out and now focusing on getting out the remaining people that we want to see out of our third countries and helping to forge internationally, which the Prime Minister is leading on, I believe, and I'm confident, uh, uh, on all of those priorities that I've mentioned. Okay. Uh, Graham, forgive me. Uh, thank you. We're in different political parties, uh, Foreign Secretary. I, I, I've no doubt uh, that you want to do the best for the people who need to uh, get out of Afghanistan. I've, I've no doubt about that at all. But on, on the surface, this looks at like a, a failure of planning on a, on a grand scale. Uh, people are at risk, some people who have uh, died, probably who we don't know about yet. And all I've heard you say is that you wish you'd come back from holiday earlier. Are there any other regrets that you have? Any, anything you wish that in policy terms or you yourself had done differently to be more effective in rescuing and, and, and saving people? Well, first of all, and that's not all I said, um, I, I have said in, with the benefit of hindsight I would have come back, but I've also talked through what we achieved, um, not just for British nationals, not just for uh, the Afghans at work for us, but for the judges, the women's rights defenders, the journalists. I've also talked through the next phase and how we need to um, uh, reinforce uh, all those efforts to get uh, people out of our third countries whilst Kabul Airport is not operational. Um, we'll always continue to learn. I mean, I've, I've read through three examples where uh, post the COVID uh, repatriation effort, you and your committee made a series of response uh, recommendations uh, and we, uh, we embraced them. You know, I came to this committee uh, readily when uh, the chair suggested that they wanted to hold the meeting today. I would suggest um, it was originally scheduled for an hour and I need to, to, to leave, but I would suggest given the questions we, we go on for another half an hour um, and I hope that demonstrates to the committee how I take the scrutiny uh, very seriously and also I think it is a, a part of ensuring that my department and myself can be as on our game as possible. I, I, but can I just say, I, I think uh, there have been a little bit of breezing over some of the operational challenges uh, given the rapid fall uh, beyond the expectation of Kabul and what that really meant on the ground, what it meant for Afghans, whether they were willing to get to the airport, whether we can get our nationals to the airport, not just because of the logistical obstacles but because of fear and the, uh, the, 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 the anxiety. Um, we were dealing with all of that and, and, I, and I would still stand by the fact that not just the military but the civilian MOD, Home Office, SCDO staff have pulled off a quite remarkable evacuation of people, greater in challenge and scale than anything, certainly in living memory. Uh, but, but of course we'll continue to learn all of those lessons. Are you going to yeah, I, 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 of course, I wouldn't deny, I don't think any member of the committee would do, uh, deny that everybody involved in the operations on the ground were at risk and it was extremely operationally uh, difficult. What I was trying to ascertain uh, for the future and to understand what has happened, whether you believe anything could have, you could have done anything better or the Foreign Office uh, could have done anything better. For instance, it has been reported in the press uh, that the Department thwarted efforts to uh, set up overland escape routes to the surrounding countries of Afghanistan over quite a long uh, period in the run-up. Uh, to August. That's been reported. You can tell us if it's true or not. But I, I'm interested because you, you must have, in the privacy of the, the Foreign Office, thought we could have done that better. We should have done that with all the difficulties. And I think this committee would be interested in, in those views of, of the experience. Of course, Graham, and it's a fair challenge. On the first point, it's absolutely nonsense to say that the FCDO thwarted attempts to create uh, lines out of the country. The reality is. Of course, a lot of those third countries are very apprehensive and what they need to know is that we're going to support them uh, by uh, having a workable system to get our nationals out. Otherwise, you see what happens has happened with Uzbekistan, which is the border goes up. In terms of my own position, if, uh, in fairness, I haven't had a lot of time to sit back and uh, muse and mull, uh, but, but of course I'm always open to learning lessons from the future. I think we need to get beyond 
the uh, stage of the crisis that we were at with the evacuation um, and uh, draw in all of that experience and look at it with a calm and sober uh, reflection. But of course I will do that. I think any responsible uh, minister, frankly anyone in any other walk of life will do that. Looking at various things in, in the round, are you content that the shift patterns, the rotors, the effort that was put in, in the UK, not just in Afghanistan but in the crisis centre in the UK, matched the requirement of the operation? Yes, I mean, uh, and we looked at it, uh, and I looked at it uh, on a number of, of occasions to make sure, and I spoke to uh, the Director General, the Permanent Secretary, to make sure, do we need extra resource? And I, I can uh, you know, look at um, uh, the, the, the various points that, 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 that I did that and come back to you. Um, uh, but but we were all, I was constantly thinking, is there more we can do? But the real challenge in a narrow window was the safety and the security of Kabul airport. If it had an extra week... Sorry, forgive me. I accept all of the Kabul points. I don't wish to go... It's just we're going to have to look at the crisis centre question again. As you know, of course, I'm sure you will be as well. And I'm just, I'm just asking right now, are you content that you were doing the 24-7 shift seven days a week in London that were being done in Kabul? Are there any areas of the rotor that you would say needed to be augmented with people working weekends, all this sort of, I'm sure you, you'll already be thinking about it. Well, look, we were running a three shift 24 seven operation since the 15th. Uh, we had partners across government embedded uh, into the structure, including seven from the Home Office and the Border Force, six from uh, HM Passport Office, 100 from MOD. Uh, of course, I want to glean the lessons and readily embrace the opportunity to make Sorry. sure we're in an even better uh, position next time around, God forbid anything like this happens again. But we do that, and I, and I think the evidence for that, Tom, is how we responded after what I also think was a very impressive uh, repatriation effort on COVID. We still looked at ourselves in the mirror, asked ourselves all of those difficult questions and got better. And you in, can see it. Indeed, Foreign Secretary, I'm, I, I appreciate your points. I'm, uh, I, I get the lessons learned. I'm going to come to two very quick ones, if I may, Bob, really. Brief. Just, yes, just a quick one. You said that once the, the, the US pulled out, it, uh, a, a, a NATO operation without the US was a non-starter. Was that due to either lack of political will by other NATO countries? Was it due to lack of funding or desire to fund? Or are we talking about technical capacity and capability? Because that seems to be an important question for the future. Are we always going to be dependent on the US for mm. forward deployment? Or can you do forward deployment without the US? So what was the answer for this one? I think, it, you, you know, you're talking about all of the NATO allies, they might give variations on a theme, but I think all of those factors would be relevant. Um, there's probably a psychological confidence as well uh, without the US, and I think you're right to say we need to look at uh, our own uh, capabilities and, and uh, to do so in concert with our partners. If you look at the integrated review, one of the things we talked about is the importance and the ability to operate in a more agile way with clusters of like-minded countries. Um, this is already part of the, uh, the, the strategic um, analysis, uh, notwithstanding that, of course, the US will remain our closest ally. One of your predecessors in your office once said in a meeting when I was uh, still in uniform that if we don't have the capability, we don't have the responsibility. Would you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. And, you know, since uh, international relations theory, there's always been the crucial question, have you reconciled your ends and your means. I think that is clearly from 2001 right the way through our 20 years a question. Um, I'm not saying that the last two years uh, that's on our watch. We take responsibility for it, that's why I'm here. I do think there are questions about uh, what was the mission, how it adapted, have we at every stage reconciled our means with our ends uh, and what the exit looked like in a realistic and credible way. Uh, but that is a much more strategic and, and I suspect, historic question, uh, as well as all of the lessons we're learning now. Thank you. Sorry, very brief one from Stuart, and then I'm going to Royston and Claudia. Foreign Secretary, can I just take you back to the, the point you made about the, the cover and the rotors that you just mentioned a second yeah. ago? My understanding is all military leave was cancelled on the 23rd of July. Did you initiate a similar process for the Foreign Office? No. We, what I did was make sure um, that we had... Uh, cover a decent rotor system because you didn't know for how long this would endure. Of course, we were pressing for a, 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 an extension uh, of the, the window, um, in which case you need to make sure with an emergency response team and indeed 
your team in theatre, that you're able to, uh, to, to resource those properly, but also make sure that you can retake them. Otherwise, you've got a much greater risk of mistakes happening. I think many would think that if all military leave was cancelled on the 23rd of July, it was a bad idea for yourself, the Prime Minister, uh, and several other officials uh, in the FCD or the Home Office and the MOD uh, to take breaks at that time, but I'll leave it to that. We'll move on. Uh, Royston. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I think we'll try and move on a bit. Um, we've spoken to NGOs and others that have been on the ground in Afghanistan looking after communities uh, for a longer period of time than we've been deployed. And of course, they'll be worried about what comes next. Foreign Secretary, you said that you would use um, sanctions, aid, and access to the international uh, monetary financial system yeah. in order to put pressure on the Taliban. Um, how do you propose to do that? And do you think that will have an impact on? the Afghan people. Clearly we've got to try and be discerning between the pressure we seek to rightly apply, the levers we've got at our disposal on the Taliban, whilst not exacerbating the situation for um, ordinary Afghans. But there are some things, um, so for example, uh, we of course want to get the humanitarian aid to those who need it most. I think there's going to be an interesting question about what kind of support we can provide to the neighbouring countries. We've got a track record of doing that, for example, um, uh, with the Rohingya refugees that, 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 that went into other countries. So what aid can we do to support that? I think we do need to talk seriously with the Taliban. I think it's one of the early tests. Will they allow a permissive environment for UN and humanitarian agencies uh, to act? If so, of course, we've doubled our aid to aid 286 million for Afghanistan for this year. Um, we've got allocated uh, 30 million for regional partners. We want to make sure the aid gets to those that need it most. I also think there's a strategic piece, again in the integrated review we talk about this, uh, about the regional stability that we need, which will be dependent on uh, the fragility of the situation, not in Afghanistan, not ending up with wholesale collapse. Uh, what we need to do is set some early tests uh, uh, for the Taliban. I'm, I'm realistic, as I think others have said, uh, about the Taliban, but they did at least show in the context uh, of the evacuation from the airport, that they could communicate a message and undertaking, and broadly, with some exceptions on the ground at roadblocks, follow through on it. Uh, it's important then to set further tests and judge them by their ability to behave in a reasonable and constructive way, and that will be critical for the humanitarian lifeline. So, I mean, we, it, was a it was a military coalition of several countries. Um, will this be a coalition of how we use aid and how we allow the Taliban access to the, uh, you know, the World Bank and the rest, or is it going to be something the UK will do unilaterally? And if necessary, will we? And do we have the capacity to do that? Well, we believe in doing, uh, playing a role, playing a leading role. That's why we've announced the resettlement scheme. It's why we've uh, done what we've done to double ODA to £286 million pounds this year. Uh, but, but crucially, Britain can't deal with the humanitarian situation, certainly not the refugee uh, crisis alone. So what you hope to do is lead by example and then galvanise others. And that's why the G7 has been important. That's why the G7 with the Qataris, uh, Turkey, uh, the NATO Secretary General was important. That's why we have circulated the G7 paper, which is articulating these things, because we do need uh, a security mindful response, but also uh, a humanitarian response. Uh, I think, uh, but it will be stepping stones towards this because uh, of the tensions between many of the regional partners, that we need a contact group, an international contact group. There's been contact groups before uh, in the context of Yugoslavia and other countries. And what you need is to get the membership there the key regional players that are influential in the Taliban, I think the key Western but also the Gulf countries which will uh, provide support will not want to see Afghanistan uh, disintegrate and that is the way, again as I say, to deal with the problem but also exercise that maximum moderating influence on the Taliban. Uh, so I, if the answer to your question will the, uh, the, the, the group of countries required to fix the, the, the situation now uh, be different in its constellation than the NATO alliance before, almost undoubtedly will need to bring in a wider group of actors. And, and, and just uh, looking at the US pulling out in the way that they did, and, and you know, we could talk about that all day long about whether we thought that was the right thing to do, do you see those as being instrumental in whatever we decide going forward by way of using these levers to get the Taliban to behave in the way that we would like? And in the event that they don't, do we see any external others, like Russia or China, making that more difficult for us? You know, we could all be throwing our aid around, 
Yeah. But who's going to get the best bang for the buck? And I don't mean looking after people, that's a given. Yeah. But I mean whether or not we invest in a, in a government, which is what the Taliban are, um, that we disagree with and don't do things the way we want them to. Well, we will not recognise the Taliban. Uh, I believe the US and uh, most of the like-minded uh, G7 countries uh, not all have said the same. But what we will do is test them and judge them by how they respond. Um, uh, I think we'll need, as I said, a much broader caucus of countries uh, involved in trying uh, to resolve this. Uh, there's, you know, the United States is going to remain uh, engaged uh, and responsible for what happens next. And of course, we want to work very closely um, with them. Thank you, Chairman. Neil, very quickly. I'm close to the US and describe them as our closest ally, but they didn't talk to you about uh, the, the closing of Bagram Airport and they refused a British request for an extension in Kabul. Um, and in March, the government was talking about an alternative alliance to extend time if needed for the evacuation. Instead, 9,000 were left behind because no alliance was formed. So, why is global Britain so isolated compared to the Great Britain under Margaret Thatcher or Tony Blair? Well, Neil, I don't think we were alone in trying to see what flexibility there was to extend the, the window with the, and United, it didn't happen. And with the United States. No, but I, 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 the US, the, the UK was not alone uh, in pressing those issues. Um, the reality is, for all the sort of uh, hyperbole you're deploying, what we've got to do is face the new reality. As I said, I, I thought there was too much wishful thinking about the consensus in US politics across the aisles about what was actually they're going to do. The, 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 the debate around forever wars, um, I thought, was quite clear, uh, and where it was going to end up and, and how much was going to change under a new administration. Uh, and, and we need to be mindful of that because the consensus in the US has, has shifted on that. And that reflects um, uh, a broad political and, I guess, underpinning that, the public view uh, of, of those conflicts. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean um, uh, that, that you know, that's a reflection, frankly, on the, the politics in the US. We still believe in being uh, an open, outward-looking internationalist country. I know the US does as well. Um, I think there's a much bigger question around effectively nation building in such inhospitable climates. I'm not saying uh, we shouldn't want and promote liberal democracy and values around the world. I think we, we, sh we should. But again, it comes back, Tom, to the point about reconciling ends with means. Um, and certainly, I think that will be, if we look back at the 20 year period of Afghanistan, 2001 to 2021, uh, I think you know, that will be an important question uh, for us to ask ourselves. Um, Claudia, you wanted to come in. Thank you, Chair. Um, 40 billion the cost to the UK, 2.25 trillion the cost to the US, hundreds of thousands of lives lost, 18.4 million people, including 10 million children, requiring humanitarian aid. 18 months we had to prepare for our exit. It just doesn't seem credible. I've listened carefully in terms of the chaos that's on the ground, the chaos that there was. It just doesn't seem credible that you were missing in action. Are you the person to take us forward? And will you now again consider your position? Look, um, I, I understand why you would want to use this committee to uh, engage in uh, the politics of this. We're very clear um, about the plan forward. I've talked it through in some detail. It involves dealing with safe passage for those that have been left behind in Afghanistan. It involves the international strategy around counter-terrorism, humanitarian relief, the regional stability uh, uh, that we need. I, I think there are lots of lessons to be learned uh, from uh, how we were caught out by the speed and the scale of the fall of Kabul. But Claudia, uh, from the UK, the US through NATO allies, and indeed the Taliban and many ordinary Afghans themselves uh, were surprised by the pace of events. Of course we need to learn the lessons of that, but I don't think uh, it is right, accurate, to suggest that the UK was alone uh, in, uh, in thinking it would take longer uh, and it would be more incremental in terms of the deterioration of the situation and the, grant, the, the consolidation of control by the Taliban. Well, you know, France started their evacuation way back in they, May. They, they, Claudia, you, this is just nonsense. They, you're comparing, uh, you're just not comparing like for like. The, in terms of, you know, we've had 40 years of uh, Western intervention, occupation, 
in Afghanistan, destabilizing uh, Afghanistan and the entire region. In effect, um, laying the way, if you like, for civil wars. What is your understanding of um, civil wars in Afghanistan and what's your, what would be your approach? I'm sure the 40 years was all Western. I think the, the, the Russians were in there before uh, Claudia. But clearly there are lessons to be learned about um, the ability uh, and the, the way in which a campaign primarily focused on counter-terrorism morphed into something more akin to nation building. Uh, we don't want to give up our ideals, our ambition, uh, our attachment to liberal democracy uh, and open societies. But we do need, as Tom has mentioned, I think I've picked up on a couple of times now, to reconcile our ends with our means to deliver them. Particularly, of course, in a wider global context where power has become more widely dispersed with the rise of the East. Okay, Bob, briefly. Just as a final question, two parts. Firstly, in the 18 months, when Trump went and the Trump uh, administration talked to the Taliban behind the backs of the Afghan government and indeed not really talking to us and be very clear to us, was there more that we could have been doing to shape uh, perceptions and understanding in the US? Because as the chairman said, South Korea is not seen as a forever war. The Cyprus deployment is not seen as a forever war. These are enduring commitments. Why wasn't Afghanistan seen as an enduring commitment in that 18 months? Could we have reframed that debate? And linked to that, can we still actually trust the US uh, as a global partner? So I talked through the back channel that we had, um, but just to say, so we were monitoring this very carefully and assiduously. And we talked about all of the conversations and the calls and the various uh, contacts that I had since the Biden administration. We were doing exactly the same. Uh, with President Trump, with my uh, opposite member Mike Pompeo, uh, previously. Um, so I, I think we've got to recognise that the support domestically in the US for those kinds of interventions has clearly fallen away. Um, and I'm not sure I agree, Bob, but I would respect you and Tom for saying that the analogies with those longer standing, uh, effectively, some of those peacekeeping operations compared to what was going, what has been happening in Afghanistan. Um, so there's a question of what our polities and our public will be willing uh, to support. Uh, I have absolutely no doubt that uh, for all the criticism of uh, the US over this, and indeed the UK, that the US will uh, bounce back. It is indispensable um, and we work with it uh, closely, uh, not just on the, the evacuation, where the coordination was very strong on the ground. Um, I spoke to Tony Blinken right the way through regularly. Um, bilaterally as well as on the NATO and the G7 uh, calls um, and we'll learn the lessons together um, but as we've set out in the IR um, we, we you know we America's our closest ally but we are also looking as we have been for some time about the agile clusters of countries that we can operate with whether it's diplomatically or in other contexts uh, I, I you know it's probably not for today, but I can give you examples of that. But forgive me, then, con then, I, and I, I'm sure we'll come to it in due course. It is, however, quite striking uh, that this major decision had, did happen without as much warning as I know many of us would have wished. Can I just, uh, there's a few clear up points. I'm going to just come to a, a very specific point. Those who applied under the FCO scheme, leave of entry outside the rules. I didn't catch that, sorry. Those who applied. Uh, for uh, protection under the leave of entry outside the rules, the one that the FCO managed. You'll be aware, and forgive me, this is entirely personal, but it, as you know, that I do have a very personal interest here. Over the four years that I served in Afghanistan, I uh, employed at various points many different interpreters. Mm. One of them who worked for me uh, applied under that scheme, and uh, he uh, had to apply in, uh, via me on the 13th, the 14th, the 15th, the 16th, the 21st, the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, until he was finally called forward on the 25th. When he finally uh, didn't get through uh, into Kabul airport, he managed to make it to a border, and you'll forgive me for not identifying where at this point, and has uh, been struggling to have that permit, as it were, that uh, agreement, ratified for uh, his onward travel into this next country. Could you just confirm that anybody who applied and was accepted under leave of entry outside the rules will have their permissions guaranteed? So first of all, I, 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 as you know, I'm very familiar with your case. I know you are, and I'm we grateful are to your team for everything up. Uh, we can. Um, the, the challenge 
for, for all of these cases is uh, any third country that is going to want to uh, be willing to process, uh, certainly the ones I've spoken to, is going to want to know that there is a, uh, an absolute undertaking to take the individuals. And uh, so we take the, they'll take them, we'll identify them, and then we'll process them and, and bring them home. Uh, I think there is a, a very real question uh, beyond the question of strict UK nationals, um, where of course we're duty bound to take them home, but there is a question of the security checks and how we will operate that. So forgive me while we work through the details, I've been talking to the Home Secretary and the Defence Secretary about this, uh, we work through the details. But Forgive we want to come up with a workable situation. I accept this foreign secretary. So that we, sorry, Tom, just to, and then come back. We want to come up with a workable situation where we can give effect to all the undertakings uh, that we've made, uh, but at the same time, I think rightly, be very careful that we don't end up uh, allowing people back to the UK who might pose us a threat. I, I understand all of that, Foreign Secretary. It's just that had he managed to get onto the airhead on the 25th of August, and it's nobody's fault and certainly not yours that he didn't make it through the yeah. press of crowds. But had he made it onto the airhead on the 24th, 5th of August, he would have probably been in the UK by the 26th. As it is, because he didn't, he finds himself on a border and unable to pass through uh, a week later. And it just it seems so slightly incongruous that he could have got a direct flight, but he can't get an indirect one because the terms of the deal seem to have changed in the last five days. And I'm sure that's a bureaucratic issue rather than a policy change. And I was just wondering if you could clarify well, that. that again, I, I, forgive me for not delving into the individual case for of the course, reasons you indeed, gave. Yeah. But I don't think it's just a bureaucratic issue. The question is how we can make sure that we have proper assurances around se security Well, you must have had them before you gave permission on the 25th, surely? Well, these are the issues that we're working through. So we want to be able to do this in a workable and secure way. I, I think people would look uh, for all the pressures that you rightly press, and I, and I will, you know, we will keep a very close eye on what we can do in this individual case and others. I think... Uh, uh, I mean, I, we I would be facing a whole different range of questions, of course, Tom, if we didn't make sure that we weren't careful around the security checks for those coming in. I completely accept that, Foreign Secretary, and I'm sure people would be concerned if they felt that we'd been cavalier on the 25th but were stricter on the 1st, for example. I'm sure that would raise concerns as well. So I'd just be grateful if you can clarify that. May I just uh, ask as well, there are many people, uh, and it was reported that many people who wrote on the Afghan special cases email to the FCDO may or may not have been opened. Anybody who has filed an application under leave of entry outside the rules, is the Foreign Office going to accept that entry or must they resubmit? So um, on the, uh, the emails, I mean I've gone through that, we, 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 we're triaging them to the various different schemes. Sure. And we will get back and make sure um, that my, my commitment is to make sure that we send a reply to all MPs' emails, uh, certainly the ones that are received by the 30th of August, because they're, of course, new ones coming in all the time, uh, by close of play on Monday, the 6th of September. Uh, we will have read and assessed all the other emails received by the 30th of August uh, by close of play on Monday, the 6th of September. And then we'll be in a position to signpost uh, to the best advice. Uh, that, that we can give them in terms of the new phase and access out by third countries. And there will still be three categories. There will be, as it were, the Home Office category for British nationals. There will be the leave of entry outside the rules under the Foreign Office and ARAP under the Ministry of Defence. Is that correct? Well, the leave outside the rules will uh, transition into the broader resettlement uh, criteria, which will obviously be based on uh, objective criteria around uh, asylum. But of course, we're looking very carefully at those cases, uh, particularly the cases that were called forward. So anybody who was called forward may or may not still have an extant permission to come to the UK, depending want, on the change in the rules? We want, we want to make sure all of those that were Call no, sorry, forgive me. I accept you want to make it sure, but but are they currently well, still a, able to travel, or is is that now expired? Well, in terms of able to travel, that will depend. Well, if on they make it to Pakistan or Uzbekistan, so the, the issue we've got to reconcile in relation to non-UK nationals is the security checks uh, before individuals get to a third country where they will automatically be expected to come home. I think it's right we make sure we work through that. Okay, and. You mentioned emails to members of parliament. Uh, there are many others, as you know, who are submitting emails on behalf of people, including, of course, aid agencies. Will you make that commitment as well for them? Well, responding to aid agencies in the same way as you said you were going to respond to MPs by the 6th of September. Um, let me uh, look at what we can uh, do on that. We want to get back to everyone. Uh, the, the reality is, by the way, the reason the backlog built up is not just um, 
the search for the door in the narrowing window, there are lots of MPs, quite rightly, and others looking for multiple updates. We made a conscious decision, so I want to be honest about this, to say, OK, we can answer every email that we get, or we can focus resource on getting uh, as many eligible people through Kabul onto air flights, filling capacity back home. Uh, and I think that was still the right choice, and I think the numbers bear that out. But of course, uh, I'm very conscious of the need to give people update, and then uh, a sense of uh, signposting as to where to go next with the advice. We, we are committed to fulfilling the undertakings we've already made. Uh, but it's more difficult now, of course. I thought, I, I thought that, the, that um, Michael Gove was chairing a group that was looking at the criteria, but you, you seem to be announcing now that the criteria um, for the Afghan resettlement scheme will be asylum. No, 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 no oh. that, that's not uh, the case, but they're not going to be, I mean, they're going to be a different uh, uh, set of cases from the Arab workers and mm. the nationals. Uh, the criteria, uh, right, um, uh, the, I mean, the truth is, uh, I'm working that through with the Home Secretary, um, but of course we will want to work very closely with the UN and other organisations because it is wider than just the question of the individuals who are currently, if you like, uh, uh, on the emails or uh, the special cases or the current lotter uh, yeah. list. Not so, least because there's the Hazara community. It, what's your assessment? And, and of, indeed others. I mean, people have raised the LGBT community. So yeah, we, need no, to, no, but so we sorry, do need to look at this can, in the round. I know, but I just want you to go to answer the point about the Hazara community. Is it your understanding? I know you won't want, want, want to use the word genocide. We've been around that battle many times. But um, the Taliban have referred themselves to genocide against the Hazara people. Is that your assessment? Is there a deliberate attempt by Taliban to kill Hazara? Well, we, we, look, we are very anxious for their vulnerability. I'm not sure it, 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 the evidence hits the tripwire for that yet, but of course, as you know, I, I, I think that becomes a bit of a distraction from the point of view of trying to provide protection for vulnerable people. Of course, we want to look at them and all the other uh, ethnic minority groups, Sikhs and others, who are vulnerable at this point in time. That, it's it's that, just that all the cases that I've sent through come from that community, and I know that applies no, to quite a lot of well, We want to look at that very carefully, okay. Chris, and I understand it. But, yeah, but, okay. but that's all the more reason, mm. because there'll be different people with different yep. communities, to look at this in the round, which is what okay. we need. Can I just challenge you on this question about phone numbers that haven't worked? Because the, the number that MPs were given, you rang it, 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 it rang for ages and ages and ages, nobody answered it, and then eventually it said, please send an email to the following. When you sent an email to that every email address, it bounced back with the thing saying, please ring this telephone number. Can, can I just challenge that? Because I, 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 I knew that this would be asked, and I went and got the data, and I could tell you what the data is. Between the 16th of August and the 26th, the average waiting time to, to pick up a call on the MP hotline was under a minute. For the same period for the public lines, it was... Um, uh, a range of between 40 seconds and 3 minutes 49 seconds. So if someone had a bad no, experience... You, you, you said that in the chamber, I know, and, and I, I would ask you just to push, to, to push back to officials on that because I'm not... Every MP I know has had the same experience of not being able to get a telephone... Well, that's why I've checked the data, Chris. So I, I, I came equipped to, to give you the answer to your question mm. and to do it very uh, okay. transparently. All right, let me do another one. Um, swift one. Uh, I think you'll have seen the Newsnight report about embassy staff telling people to go to the Abbey Gate um, on the very day of the ISIS-K attack when the military advice was not to go. The, yeah, look, um, we changed our travel advice for Afghanistan just after 10 p.m. on Wednesday the 25th of August, that was the night before the attack. At the same time, we stopped asking British nationals and Afghan nationals, uh, whether they were Arab or, or Lotra, to come to the airport. Uh, the military worked very hard to secure the area. Um, uh, and we also shifted the civilian team uh, from the Abbey Gate, the Ab the, sorry, the Barons Hotel Processing Centre uh, through to the airport to protect them. So we took all of those mitigating measures and obviously in close consultation with the US. I, I saw that, that report from Newsnight about the email saying go to Abbey Gate. Uh, I, I need to investigate it. Um, but, okay. but, but the general advice as opposed to individual uh, advice and, and if there was a lag, we need to look at that. And but I don't but you will investigate and you'll come, uh, you'll come back to us on that. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, I understand in a chaotic circumstance it can be very difficult. Can I just put one final thing to you, which is you, you referred to what it's like working in the, um, and, and how ambassadors report back and it all gets melded into one advice. 
can I just suggest to you that sometimes there is a danger in the Foreign Office of groupthink. I know you're aware of this because you've often referred to it yourself, and I just wonder whether sometimes you wouldn't have been better advised over the last few months to pick up the phone to the person on the ground more often. Well, let me answer that. So first of all, we don't just mould it into some homogenous uh, product. We have uh, ambassadors on those meetings virtually testing it. Uh, I do it all the time. I've done it over the last 48 hours. Uh, equally, um, we've got to use effective use of time and resource given that, and, and I come back to the point I made earlier, Afghanistan is the issue that has clearly caught us uh, uh, unawares in terms of the pace and the scale of the Taliban um, uh, uh, grip of, uh, control, ex uh, uh, imposition of control. But there are a whole range of other issues that we're dealing with. Uh, I know, but day. if you don't learn from this situation about how to challenge and get better intelligence we, and information back, well, we'll do it again no, no, and we'll capitulate no, again and we will drag no, the British Chris, honour through the mud again. No, Chris, two things. One, no one in the SEDO thinks I don't challenge official advice uh, rigorously. Um, I do. Uh, if anything, uh, I get accused of, uh, you know, uh, of being over uh, inquisitorial. Um, but I do think it's important. And indeed, the Foreign Office as an institution was testing, and we did across government. That's not to say there aren't lessons to be learned. But you've also got to look uh, at, uh, and uh, you know, the 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 sort of caricature of critique against me is that I'm uh, either lazy uh, and delegating too much, or a control freak. Uh, the truth is, uh, you need to exercise grip, but you also need to be willing to delegate. If you don't do that, you will never take decisions, and you will also never engage with the international interlocutors whom we need to influence. I take your point. We're going to move on very, very briefly. Claudia, then Alicia, and then we're... Just very briefly, Chair, just on the issue of AIDS, uh, aid uh, charities and humanitarian aid. I just wondered what humanitarian aid and charity organisations are you aware of on the ground, or your office is aware of on, your, on the ground, in terms of engaging with them? Um, well, the, 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 so the, I spoke to Jean Arnaud, who's the UN uh, Secretary General Special uh, Envoy for Afghanistan. The, clearly the situation uh, for most is very precarious indeed, uh, if they can still operate at all. Um, so we're worried about that. Um, uh, so the it, question is, which, which ones have, have your office, or you've been engaged with, uh, on the ground. Well, if you want to, and list, if you haven't got that list, you can, you, can list, you provide that to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and just very quickly, just on the issue of in inclusivity and the issue of minorities, what work is being done with the UN to create safe zones within Afghanistan uh, for religious minorities, for uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, plus others communities? Um, what is being done to keep people safe? We already know that inclusivity as far as the Taliban government is concerned will not include um, uh, those groups. Look I totally share your concerns Claudia but if you're talking about uh, safe zones or no-fly zones that would require uh, military enforcement and clearly uh, that is not something that, uh, uh, that is being proposed right now. It is very difficult to see how what you're quite understandably proposing would be workable in the absence of uh, political commitment, and I, and I don't see that there's support for it at the moment. Alicia, very briefly for me. Um, I think the entire committee wants to give their heartfelt gratitude to all the Foreign Office staff, RDT, desk, uh, post, neighbouring post, crisis centre. Um, can you give us reassurances that sufficient mental health and trauma recovery services have been provided to them, and that when their military colleagues are recognised, we will also recognise those civilians who did so much to save lives? It's a really important point, Alicia, and uh, um, not just those that worked in Kabul, and Sir Laurie Bristow, I think, I'm sure the committee will agree, did a, 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 an incredible job under the most extraordinary pressure. But also people that manned the crisis centre. Um, that, that was gruelling. Uh, and of course making some of those decisions is very difficult. Um, but you've got to make the decisions to get the maximum people onto the capacity we have. But your broader point is very well made and we're already doing everything we can, both on the uh, welfare side but also on the recognition. Thank you very much indeed, Foreign Secretary. Um, we're very grateful that you uh, overstayed uh, and helped us so much with our inquiry. This is clearly going to be an ongoing, challenging uh, question for all of us. And we'd be very grateful if you'd come back to us very soon for a follow-up hearing because this is going to be the single biggest challenge that I suspect the UK deals with in terms of redefining our foreign policy. 
I stand by uh, the view that this is the single biggest foreign policy disaster that the UK has faced since Suez in the sense that it has exposed a weakness uh, in our alliances and in our stance. And I'd be very interested in hearing when you have time to actually process it and not just firefight uh, your own views on how this will change uh, how we do foreign policy. I'm very happy to come back to the committee. Thank you uh, uh, for the rigorous engagement. It's very important and also to get a factual account. I, I'm afraid I, I struggle with the sewers analogy, but I understand what you're really searching for is to learn the lessons and even more importantly, find uh, a path forward for Afghanistan more generally. Thank you very much. On that basis, order, order.